There are times in our life uh, when we do go through challenges and struggles and it's almost like a valley experience and we begin to question the reality of God. We begin to question authenticity of his word. We begin to doubt whether this book is still relevant today, whether this book is inspired and is really God's word. Yesterday, as I was walking, uh, apparently, you know, yesterday the weather wasn't that good. Um, it was cold, but we did get a little bit gap where, where it wasn't raining. And I managed to have uh, uh, some time to go and take a walk with my boy. We spent one hour just walking. I did, uh, usually he would take his scooter, but I said, no, today we'll just walk. Because I wanted him to get tired so that he can sleep early, late in the evening. <laughs> So he walked for an hour, and poor boy, he was tired towards the end. I had to carry him on my shoulders home because he didn't want to walk anymore. And while we were taking this walk, I was thinking in my, because some of you, you know Avishai, he has some challenges. He is still nonverbal. We are hoping for God's miracle, and uh, we believe that he will speak, definitely. Uh, so while we were walking, uh, I was thinking, what is it that I'm going to pass, pass it on to him? What is it that I want to leave with him? Many things ran through my mind as I'm walking and I'm, I'm talking to him. Obviously, he doesn't respond back, but he does look at you and uh, he indicates to you that, yes, he is listening. He knows what is going on. And I'm just talking to him, and I'm sharing about God, and I'm telling him Jesus loves you. And as, as we keep on walking, that's what I was uh, just thinking, that what is it that I'm going to pass it on to him? Joshua chapter 1 has a passage. Can we go to that text, please? It says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then, only then, you shall make thy way prosper, or then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good Success. As we study through the book of Deuteronomy and we come to the book of Joshua, we know Moses is old man. And Joshua is about to take over. And these are the words that God is speaking to Joshua. And God is highlighting to Joshua. Joshua, remember this book of the law. At that time, Torah was in existence. New Testament didn't, have, uh, didn't come into existence at that time as yet. And God was telling to Joshua that remember this book of the law. It shouldn't depart from you as a young man. Meditate upon it day and night. And if you observe what is recorded in this book, you will prosper, you will have good life, you will have success in your life. But here's the question, that as we navigate through our life, as dark times hit us and we are faced by the wall, sometimes some of those challenges, they really, really challenge our faith, challenge our belief in this book. So I'm starting a two-part series. It's titled, Can We Still Believe the Bible? And then the second question that we will be addressing is, does it really matter? Does it really matter that I have to believe 
in this book. Because we live in a day and age where there are many other ways that we can be inspired and encouraged. There are tons of people, they browse Google, they go onto internet, and they look for quotes, inspirational speakers, and they listen to them. So they can be inspired, so they can keep on moving on forward. What is it that makes this book different than many people out there who are like motivational or inspirational speakers? They may not even believe in this book. So for next two weeks, we're going to focus on this book and only this book. So two questions, can we still believe the Bible and does it really matter? Now, if you think logically, we can't really go to the first question, can we believe the Bible, if it doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter, then why really even bother spending time? So does it really matter that I have to believe in this book? So today, in part one, we are just going to focus on does it really matter that I believe in this book? In the past 2,000 years, many people, many well-known people throughout the history, they have believed in the Bible. I have a picture there. We have Leonardo da Vinci. He believed in the Bible. We have Michelangelo. We have Henry VIII. We have James I, Elizabeth I. We have Queen Victoria. We have Elizabeth Fry. We have Florence Nightingale. We have Abraham Lincoln. We have George Washington. We have William Shakespeare. We have John Milton. We have Sir Isaac Newton. We have Sir Robert Boyle. All of these famous people they believed in this book. But as time went, things started changing. Around 300 years ago, things started changing. They developed a period known as the Age of Reason, or the Enlightenment period. This period set the scene for our secular society we have today. As the Enlightenment developed, criticism of the Bible grew stronger both on the European horizon or continent and also in England. Movement began somewhere during the 17th and 18th century, but its results reached the peak in the 19th and early 20th century. That is the time many people begin asking questions, can we really believe this book? So whatever challenges we are experiencing today, we have all around us people who don't really believe in this book. That actually goes all the way back to the 17th century, 18th century. And starting from that time onward, it reached really the peak in the 20th century. And here is someone who said that his name is Fre uh, Friedrich Delisch, a prominent German scholar. This is what he says. Uh, he comes from 1921. He says, the biblical text, this book, had been subjected to a degree of corruption beyond our wildest imagination. Wow! For someone to come or arrive at such conclusion, despite all the evidences, is quite incredible. So does it really matter for us to still believe in this book? Critics promoted that the Bible is full of myths, and legends. Can we then in these enlightened, sophisticated, technological times still believe the Bible? Is it true? Is it relevant? Does it really matter? Could it really be the word of God? Could this, be, uh, this book change my life? Can this book offer me some hope in the times when I'm struggling? Can this book still be trusted in the times when I want God to talk and let there be 
thundering and lightning so that I can actually know and be sure that God is out there and I can still trust in Him. Can I still believe in this book when everything is quiet? There is no sound, there is no thundering, there is no lightning, and God is nowhere to be seen. There are at least seven, seven reasons why it matters whether we can believe in the Bible. Number one reason. The Bible's own claims for itself. Before I go on and share what I have today, I would like you to have a look at this book. It's written by Brian Ball. Can we still believe the Bible and does it really matter? It is, it is very much for the beginners. If you're really looking for deep stuff, probably that's, this is not the book, but this has incredible, incredible materials that can help us to discover and answer some of these questions, especially th those two questions. So my presentations have actually incorporated some of the materials from Brian Ball. So seven reasons why it really matters for us to believe in the Bible. Number one is the Bible's own claims for itself. Some of the claims that this book has made, if any other book was to make those claims, you would be thinking that person who has, whoever has written that book is out of his mind. Imagine if Brian Ball, who wrote this book, was to make some of the claims that this book has made, you would be thinking that Brian is out of his mind. He has no idea what he is saying. So some of the claims this book is making about itself tells us that it really matters for me to actually believe in the book. Number one is the Bible song is, is on claims about itself. So it claims, what does this book claim? It claims to be God's word to human race. It claims to be God's word to the world at large. It claims to be God's word to the church. It claims to be God's word that has been communicated to his church, to his people, through apostles and through the prophets throughout the centuries. Number two, under this uh, first claim that Bible claims to be uh, God's word, and the second one is, it records God's hand in history. Through this book, we come to know the history of the people of Israel. We know that God led them out of Egypt. We know that God helped them to cross the Red Sea. We know that God helped them to conquest over Canaan. We know of Israelites that they went into exile, into, uh, into Babylon. Babylonians came and they took them into exile. We know that God intervened for his people and redeemed them and offered them freedom. Bible, this book offers evidence that God has had hand in the affairs of nations on earth. This book tells us that God is the one who removes kings and raises them up. Daniel chapter 2 is the clear evidence of that. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and in that dream, God helped him to see that God is the one who will be raising the nations. God is the one who will be allowing nations to fall. This book also tells us that God can cause the rise and fall of nations. He uses earthly rulers and nations to achieve his purposes even though they do not always realize at the time that they are being so used by God. He can deal with nations in a way that makes them examples to other nations. This book tells us about that. This book tells us about earthly rulers exercise their authority only with God's consent. Nothing is beyond God's sovereignty. In the future, the nations will, be, will come before him in judgment. In Revelation chapter 9 verse 15 we see, and that is recorded in this book. What does that mean? If God has control over nations, if God has control over the affairs of this planet, then definitely God has control over the affairs in my life. That is why it gives me hope. 
Here's a quote from this book, Brian Ball. This is what he writes on page 12. He says, to many people, including many who are not Christians, the world today seems out of control, plunging inevitably to a final catastrophe. The picture presented by the Bible, however, is of a God who is intimately involved with the world he created and that history moves inexorably toward a final destiny that is in God's Hands. That's why it matters that I must believe in this book. This book also predicts the future. This book tells us about what's going to come in the future. There are about 300 prophecies concerning the coming of Christ. I've got a slide up there for that. All of those prophecies, they were made hundreds of years before even Jesus was born. We don't really have time to go through all those prophecies. There are prophecies about nations that are still in existence. There are prophecies in this book about the nations that have already passed on, are no more in existence and there are prophecies in this book about the nations that are yet to come. The Bible imparts wisdom and understanding. This book helps us to understand ourselves. This book helps us to understand life. This book helps us to understand history. This book helps us to understand the future. This book also helps us to understand God. In my conversations with my wife, there are times when I, I ask her, man, what is it that we need to do to really understand what God is actually thinking right now? What's on his mind? Just a few weeks ago, I took a devotional for a South Queensland conference in Brisbane. They asked me to take a devotional, so I was doing that over Zoom. And we looked at, uh, the title was, Why Hope Matters. And as I was taking devotionals uh, for their staff, we were asking these questions. Why is it that there are times God is actively working in some people's, uh, people's life and choosing to do certain things in their lives, but in other times you find him that he's very quiet. For example, when you look at John the Baptist, and the way he died, his head was cut off. Very sad and tragic end for John the Baptist. And then also you look at Isaiah as you study the tradition and God's word, you discover that under the rulership of Manasseh, Isaiah was actually cut into two pieces. He died really painful, horrendous, tragic death. But then you also discover that there are times when God chooses to save people. Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are thrown into the fiery furnace. And Jesus turns up there. The ropes that they use to tie them up, they burn. None of their hair is burned. None of their clothes is burned. They come out of this fiery furnace safe. Then John the Revelator, who wrote the, book, who wrote the book of Revelation, we know historically that he was actually thrown into a boiling oil, a tub of boiling oil, and nothing happened to him. Poor Romans, they didn't know what to do with him. And they finally decided that because we can't really kill this man, they had to just cast him away on an island of Patmos so that he couldn't create any more trouble for them. And as you look at these people's lives, you wonder why is it that God didn't do anything for, the John, for John the Baptist when they were coming to kill him, when they were cutting his head? Why didn't God intervene during Isaiah's time when they were cutting him into two? Why is it that God chose to intervene in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's life and save them from getting burnt? 
Why is it that God intervened when they threw John the Revelator into a boiling tub of oil? And he saved him. This book helps us to understand that there are times when God chooses and allows things to happen in a certain way. And there are times when God chooses to act and save. But can I still believe God? Can I still believe His book? Even the outcome is not in my favor. Even if I end up dying for him, even if the outcome in my life while I'm navigating through difficulties isn't the positive one, can I still believe this book? This book is a source of information about Jesus. More books have been written about Jesus than any other person. He has inspired more great music than anyone else who ever lived. He has been the subject of more great works of art than anyone else on this planet. More great architect has been created to honor Jesus than anyone else in history. This book records entire life of Jesus and also to the extent that Jesus is the one who actually divided the calendar into two. His life. Divided the calendar into B.C. and A.D. I have a quote here I wanted us to read. It says, apart from three or four brief references to Jesus in early Jewish and Roman literature, which do little more than confirm his existence, the only source of information about this incredibly influential and enduring person is the Bible. Without the Bible, he might as well never have existed. The incalculable good that has come to the human race over the past 2,000 years would never have happened apart from the Bible. So does it really matter that I consider and refer this book to someone else as authentic source of inspiration or as authentic God's word. This book also tells us about the possibility of life to come. All the great works of literature have a theme and purpose and usually a central character as well. And as we look at this book, in this book there is a theme. In this book we have the central character. In this book we have the news about the life to come. We know that the Bible has the central character starting from the book of Genesis to the Revelation and that is none other than Jesus. We know that the theme of this book is eternal life. We know that God is in control of the affairs of this planet. God is in control of the affairs that are happening within my life. And the good news is that there is future. There is life to come. And that's this book offers such hope. This book also offers relevance to life. There are many people who say that this book has nothing to offer. Why should I even read it? I wish we can actually spend time and look at it because this book is way more relevant than anything that we can find on this planet. This book is relevant to our life. This book is relevant to my affairs and my difficulties. This book is relevant to my times of sickness and death. This book is relevant in my times of discouragement and despair. This book is relevant in times of perplexity. This book is relevant for me in my times of trial and temptation. This book is relevant for me in times of darkness and in times of confidence. This book is relevant for young people, old people, women and men. This book is relevant for human race. Could that be why the Bible remains still as a bestseller throughout the history? There is no other book that has ever been published more than Bible itself. Bible is the bestseller to this day. 
The Bible talks about birth and death. The Bible talks about youth and old age. It talks about joy and sorrow, hope and despair, poverty and riches, sickness and health. It talks about making and losing it. It talks about pride and humility. It talks about family and friends. It talks about love and hate, peace and war, work and play, tears and laughter, husbands and wives. It talks about parents and children, the past, the present and the future. And it talks about the real people in the real situations and in the real world. This book has a lot to offer for me. Its ability to change lives. I have a story from Mozambique. The, the name of the lady is uh, Alima. She lost her father when she was very young. And her, she had two brothers and uh, mom was left alone to look after her. And she stayed in Mozambique. She was living in, uh, in a city, Motipu. And... Uh, she lived a very, very poor life. In Mozambique, you have, on average, uh, you have uh, nearly one in two people who are trapped in chronic poverty. And because she lived a very poor life, she didn't have much hope. And there was a time when she felt sick. And the people who were around her and the relatives, they told her to actually go and uh, visit uh, which who can heal her. And the place where she was staying was also not the best place because she was staying very close to a black market where people just uh, were selling things. Uh, they were setting their own prices. So they were really struggling. The mother was really struggling raising these three kids. But one day she turned, uh, she happened to meet a Christian person who invited her to the church. And here are her words. This is what she says. Can we have the quote, please? The Bible changed my life. A young lady from Mozambique, she says, the Bible changed my life. Whenever I open my Bible, I feel God in the scriptures and can interact with me. The Bible is God in my hands and heart with art. The Bible, my life would be terrible without a Bible and Jesus, I was just existing with no hope. But Jesus brought me from existence to life. When I got my first Bible, I felt that I had something in my life. Bible has ability to change people's lives. Alima didn't have much. She was a poor lady. Poor young person. But as soon as she had this book, that's all she needed. Her life was changed. Poverty was still there. But poverty didn't mean much to her because she had someone who had offered her eternal hope. She had now someone who controls the universe. She had someone in her hand who knows the past, present, and the future. And that's what gave her hope. Oh, I just wish that we would spend more time in this book and get to know this book because this book has the potential to change my darkness into light. This book has the potential to change my, change my despair into hope. The last point that I wanted to, uh, just the sixth one is the base, this book is actually the basis of the Western culture. You know, there are many things today we actually cherish. I come from Pakistan, which, which has very much of a Middle Eastern culture. But uh, when I arrived in New Zealand, I loved it. And I'll tell you why. Freedom. Freedom, the essence of Western culture is freedom. Freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, having the right to make our own decisions about important things in life where we live, where we work, and what kind of work we do, who our friends are, who we will marry, how many children we will have, and many other things. There are countries where people don't even have a choice how many children they will have. There are countries where young people don't have cho choice who they will marry. Parents, they decide for them. So we have freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, freedom to worship. But do you know that most of these freedoms that we actually cherish in our Western culture, 
actually come from 16th and 17th century. 16th and 17th century are the key behind these freedoms that we have today. And that is the time when Reformation took place in history. The Reformation in Europe was a religious revolution against the oppressive nature of the medieval church that had dominated European thought and life for more than 1,000 years. And that did encourage independent through or did not encourage independent or uh, independence or freedom of action and thought. So Reformation was based solidly on the Bible. Before Reformation, people had no freedom. People couldn't even read this book. Before Reformation, people didn't have a freedom to think freely. People didn't have that freedom. But today we have the basis of Western culture is freedom. But where did it come from? Reformation was based upon the Bible. This book offers the basis of Western culture. And lastly, this book is a source of hope. I have this beautiful poem. As I was preparing, I came across this. I loved it. Uh, here, this poem comes from uh, Herschel H. Hope's uh, book, My Favorite Illustrations, and is written by Willard Johnson on the Bible. It's, it reads, Generations follow generations, but this book lives. Nations rise and fall, but this book yet lives. King Dictators, presidents come and go, yet it lives. Torn, condemned, burned, yet it lives. Doubted, suspected, criticized, yet it lives. Damned by atheists, yet it lives. Exaggerated by fanatics, yet it lives. Misconstructed and misstated. Yet it lives, its inspiration denied, yet this book lives. Yet it lives a lamp to our feet, a light to our past, a standard for childhood, a guide for the young people, a comfort for the aged, food for the hungry, water for the thirsty, rest for the weary, light for the heathen, Salvation for the sinner, grace for the Christian, to know it is to love it. To love it is to accept it. To accept it means life eternal. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, this is what it reads. My son, my child... Forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. They'll not take from you. They'll not take peace from you. They'll not take prosperity and better future from you. But this book has the power to add that onto your life. It has the power to add long life. It has the power to add peace. It has the power to add happiness to your life. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. If you like wearing some sort of chain, <laughs> instead put this around your neck. Imagine somebody walking around hanging this one. It's just symbolic way or illustrative way of saying that remember, speak about it. Write them upon the table of thine heart so shalt thou find a favor and good understanding inside of God and men. Does it really matter for us to even consider believing in this book? Does it matter for you to still keep on trusting in this book despite there is silence, 
you don't see God's movements and vo- you don't hear that voice, would you still believe in that book? You don't experience any more miracles, would you still believe what it has? In our next part, we will look at the evidences. We'll go to archaeology, we'll look at the history, because if it matters for me to believe in the Bible, then we'll look at some evidences that actually suggest the authenticity and credibility of this book. So please do join us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you that we have this book that gives us hope in our despair, in our struggles, in our darkest moments of life. Thank you, Lord, that throughout the centuries, you revealed your love and care through this book. May you please help us to read it, to fall in love with this book. Because your promise is real. That this book will add peace. This book will add long life. This book will add happiness and contentment in my life. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.